are these people? Uh, so I think actually that's your segment actually is a good tie into this. Um, because BB has been getting a lot of news uh, over the last few months, especially. And given that now he was invited to speak in Congress, and now there's a hullabaloo of people basically being like, oh, I'm going to boycott, you know, um, going to this speech or whatever. Okay, whatever. So, um, but he's become the scapegoat for what is happening in Israel as if he's the cause of it, and he's not. Um, but given what I said about there's this pro-Israel like sentiment that it's actually becoming popular, like they're becoming the people that you almost love to hate. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, so we've kind of talked about it a little bit on the show. It's not just it's not the government per se, it's the culture that has been you know, cultivated by Zionism that has led to a lot of this. And BB really is just kind of following through on what his constituents want him to do. The mm. mainstream media doesn't necessarily talk about too, that too much. Um, so I kind of wanted to highlight that as, a, as to give, to remind us that it's not BB that's the issue compared to what mainstream media might kind of tell you like the idea of like oh if he leaves then everything will just vanish and like everyone will kind of think normally no mm -hmm. um there is an israeli sentiment in terms of what is happening in gaza and how essentially that they are even nothing or second class citizens and deserve to be uh destroyed um so I got this article from Foreign Policy, and this was written, I think, two months ago mm. um, by, I'm, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong. I'm sorry, sorry, but Mira Zonzin, I guess. Is how you say your name or his name. Um, um, but the title is, oops. The title is, The Problem Isn't Just Netanyahu, is Israeli Society. Despite blaming the Prime Minister, a large majority of Jewish Israeli citizens support his destructive policies in Gaza and beyond. So, they continue. Um, when U.S. Senator Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, one of the staunchest pro-Israel lawmakers in the United States and the highest-ranking Jewish official in Washington, effectively called for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's ouster on the Senate floor in mid-March, it was a watershed moment for anyone following Israel's role in U.S. politics. Israel has been so sacrosanct in America for so long that the idea that a hawkish Democrat like Schumer would call for regime change in Israel is extraordinary. But the Senate leader's stance is fairly mainstream among Israelis. There's consensus, even within his own party, that elections should be held early. Mm -hmm. It seems like conventional wisdom in Israel that Netanyahu is dragging out the war for his own political survival, since he knows the moment it comes to a halt, Israel will focus even more resolutely on investigating the failures of October 7th and pushing for earlier elections to vote him out of office. Well, keep in mind how we've talked about okay. his last election issue, where Israelis got upset at him because he didn't wasn't strong enough. Right. You know, and that's what right. this October 6th thing is, too, that because he failed in keeping people safe, failed to get hostages, yada, yada, which we know how all that works. They've been ignoring every plea deal that's been made, um, you know, is they're going to put it all on Netanyahu. We talked about blame it on a BB, uh, if you look for that <laughs> on old iron and clips, but Yeah. <clears throat> The focus on Yanyahu is a convenient distraction from the fact that the war in Gaza is not Yanyahu's war, it is Israel's war. And the problem isn't only Yanyahu, it is the Israeli electorate. Blame Yanyahu, who refuses to leave Israeli political life despite being on trial for corruption and presiding over the country during the worst catastrophe in its history, 
has eclipsed the fact that when it comes to Israeli policies on Gaza in particular, and the Palestinians in general, many Israelis are broadly aligned with Netanyahu. By a large margin, they support the current military campaign in Gaza and the government's goal of destroying Hamas, whatever the human toil for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, and we'll get to more in the numbers later. For years, Israeli have been able, through military and economic domination, to disregard the single most pressing issue facing the country, its control over millions of Palestinians. The shock and trauma inflicted by the October 7th attack opened the floodgates even further on what is considered acceptable. A large majority, 88%, of Jewish Israelis polled in January believe the astounding number of Palestinian deaths, which have surpassed 25,000 at the time, is justified. A large majority of the Jewish public also thinks that the IDF is using adequate or even too little force in Gaza. Couch mm -hmm. with the fact that Hamas forced this war of no Hamas. choice upon Israel and the people of Gaza, and that Hamas must be destroyed as a matter of Israeli survival, even the threat of imminent famine in Gaza has not provoked opposition to the campaign. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something? No. Nope. Just sounds about okay. what we were talking about earlier. Yep. Um. Further, in a February poll by the Israeli Israel Democracy Institute, Around two-thirds of Jewish respondents, 63%, said they opposed a proposal for Israel to agree in principle to the establishment of an independent, demilitarized Palestinian state. Israeli leaders have framed the movement underway internationally for governments to unilaterally recognize Palestine as a state to be rewarded the Palestinians for the October 7th attack. You don't need a poll to discover that support of a two-state solution, much less for Palestinian basic rights of freedom and self-determination, has been steadily declining among Jewish Israelis in recent years, and today is probably the lowest it has ever been. You can just look at the positions of Israel's Jewish political parties. Almost none of them endorse a two-state solution, and the ones in power actively reject it, working fractitiously to afford it from ever happening. So the idea that Biden and anybody in Congress is saying, oh, we're working on a two-state solution is bogus because... Yeah, they're never doing it. Yanyahu basically has all said quite clearly he's not for it, has never been for it. So, but yet still Biden and others are kind of like, oh, that's what we're working toward. So... It's a non -star in BB's words, it's a non-starter for them. So why are you trying to call out, why are you trying to push something that you know that your frenemy is saying, I don't want? But anyway, I digress. The thousands of Israelis who are once again turning out to march in the streets are not protesting the war. And that's something... I want you guys to think about when you see Israeli protesting in Tel Aviv. It's not for what's happening for the Palestinians. No, fuck them. Um, except for a tiny handful of, of Israelis, Jews, and Palestinians, they are not calling for a ceasefire or to an end to the war or for peace. They are not protesting Israel's killing of unprecedented numbers of Palestinians in Gaza or its restrictions on humanitarian aid that have led to mass starvation. Some right-wing Israelis even go further by actively blocking aid from entering the Strip. They are certainly not invoking the need to end military occupation now in its 57th year. They are primarily protesting Netanyahu's refusal to step down and what they see as his reluctance to seal a hostage deal. At a recent protest in Jerusalem, we are not our government, signs were front and center, echoing the distinction Democrats are making between the Yanyahu government and its people. But that distinction is misleading. Putting all the blame on the prime minister misses the point. It disregards the fact that Israelis have long advanced, enabled, or come to terms with their country's system of military occupation and dehumanization of Palestinians. That's true of other members of the war cabinet who are often depicted as counterweights or alternatives to the prime minister. It wasn't Yanyahu, but his defense minister, Yov Gallant, 
who called for a total siege of Gaza after October 7th, no electricity, no fuel, no food, everything will be closed. It wasn't Yanyahu, but the supposedly centrist president, uh, Isaac Sarak, who implied that every resident of Gaza is a, a there's a, wait, there's a, ad, oh, I think in front. We, no, it's a stupid program that wants to update. Um, um, no. It wasn't Yanyahu, but the supposedly centrist president, um, Isaac Sarag, who implied that every resident of Gaza is a legitimate target when he said at the outset of the war that there is an entire nation out there that is responsible. So, yep. so you know, so they've all pretty much said, and we've reported on this many times, they want to eliminate Palestinians. So Hamas is literally just a scapegoat. Anyway, um, this rhetoric about civilians not aware or not involved in the October 7th onslaught is absolutely not true. He later said his words were taken out of context. Yeah, fuck that. Uh, mm -hmm. Incendiary and genocidal language by various Israeli politicians and figures was well documented in South Africa's case at the International Court of Justice late last year. Which we covered. Focusing on Yanyahu also ignores the rightward drift of the Israeli police politic, bo Israel body politic, which has normalized racism and nationalism, especially evident in mainstream media's coverage of the war. Israeli news rarely shows the suffering of Gaza, almost never platforms Palestinians, and military journals seldom challenge or scrutinize the IDS version of events. It almost disregards the fact that Israelis are still showing up for a reservist duty without question, almost six months into the war, despite distrusting Yanyahu's leadership and motives, and despite having already threatened to refuse duty over the government's judicial overhaul plan. That's really interesting that I don't think people necessarily think about. People are still enrolling themselves in the idea, is basically what they're saying. So... You would think if Israelis were concerned about Gaza that they would have an issue given the draft right now. But actually, you, but it's funny, you're hearing Hamas, and this is why I'm hearing even in India, um, that Hamas membership has increased. I will also argue that in, in, this, in this article that uh, IDF um, enrollment has also increased yeah. due to this sentiment as well. Um, despite the high number of soldiers killed since October 7th, 600 and wounded, over 3,000 not including much higher numbers suffering from post-traumatic stress, mothers of soldiers are not protesting the war, a factor that played a significant role in opposition to Israel's occupation of Lebanon and eventual withdrawal. And a change of leadership won't necessarily mean, any, mean meaningful policy changes. If Benny Gantz, Israel's former defense minister and IDF chief of the general staff, who is polling well against Yanyahu, were to become prime minister, it is unlikely that he would adopt policies regarding the Palestinians that are substantially different from Yanyahu's. In 2019, Gantz released an election campaign video boasting to, of sending parts of Gaza back to the Stone Age during his term as IDF chief of the general staff in 2014. And today, like Yanyahu, he insists on an invasion of the southern Gaza city of Rafa, where up to 1.5 million local and displaced Palestinians are now concentrated to deal with what they claim will be a final and fatal blow to Hamas. He also rejects unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Instead, he has at most acknowledged the possibility for Palestinians to have an entity not a state. Indeed, as defense minister in the short-lived Nafali Bennett government in 2021, Gantz hosted Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas in his home, indicated he espoused the military's deep ingrained understanding that keeping that PA operational is a vital Israeli national security interest for maintaining control. The doctrine outlined by the Biden administration to restructure the PA and send it to Gaza 
along with creating a political process that would pry Israeli concessions toward the Palestinian state as part of a Saudi-Israeli normalization deal, is the only alternative to Israel's protracted destruction and occupation of Gaza currently on the table. Some former Israeli government and security officials have also adopted this approach since they understand it is the best option for Israel to stem further alienation from the American public and maintain some international legitimacy. A survey among Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel in February showed that half would support a political process along these lines. In this sense, some Israelis are at least searching for a pragmatic off-ramp. Whether this idea is realistic is also doubtful. It is unclear if the PA can be reformed sufficiently to regain legitimacy among Palestinians. Likewise, it is unlikely Hamas would disappear completely from the scene in Gaza. Nor does the proposed track outline what sorts of concessions Israel would need to make. But it could at least produce an immediate de-escalation in the form of a ceasefire, which is vital. Either way, it's notable that the U.S. administration is proposing it, not an Israeli leader or politician. As such, the outcome of such a process would depend on how much Israelis and Palestinians respond to a ceasefire over time, and how much the United States and other actors would be prepared to push to make that happen. For now, Israelis are largely not calling for a ceasefire. As long as Yahu is in power, the war is almost sure to drag on, along with the risk of mass death and some from starvation in Gaza, further regional escalation, and the Israeli public living in shrunken, insecure borders without ever knowing the fate of their loved ones held in Gaza. Putting all their energy into ousting Yanyahu, while understandable, keeps Israelis from assuming responsibility for their complicity in a prolonged military occupation, the destruction of Gaza, and their failure to outline a genuine political path out of the current crisis. In that sense, Yahoo is a convenient scapegoat. Any thoughts before I move on? No. I think it sounds about like what we talked about in multiple segments, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, this is blame, blame Netanyahu, and you can still continue to do the problem. So... Ugh. Yeah. Um... So I want to play this short clip. Uh, so this is from uh, Miko Paled. Um, right. He, we actually did an interview with him back, I believe, in August of last year. And actually, he was featured. We actually featured that interview in a marathon uh, segment of Ayn uh, clips pertaining to Palestine on Monday. So go mm. check that out. If not, check out this interview. I think the interview, if I remember correctly, is Israel does not equal democracy. Um, yeah. But he did this uh, interview with um, Going Underground, which is a Rumble channel. Um, so those of you who don't know, uh, Miko, is, he's Jewish. He's Israeli, uh, yeah. but an anti-Zionist. Um, founder of the Palestine House of Freedom, and he's actually the grandson of Abraham Katz Nelson, who signed Israel's Declaration of Independence. So he's a big deal. Um, his father was a general in the IDF. So, mm. so if anyone could speak more into like the Zionist slash Israeli occupation, it would be Nico. Um, but he was doing this interview. We're not going to play all of it. But if you do want to watch the whole interview, it is uh, it's going underground. Is the channel and the interview or the uh, uh, interview is called, Is This the End of Israel and Zionism? Um, so Miko has something to say regarding the Israeli culture, which kind of relates to the article. Mm. So I'll go ahead and we can hear what uh, Miko How uh, are people in Israel reacting to ongoing events? Previously, they, well, one uh, Labour Party chief uh, in uh, Israel, Mirav uh, Mishlo, said Netanyahu and Ben Gavir, the uh, people in power in uh, Tel Aviv right now, helped assassinate Rabin. How close is Netanyahu to assassination? Well, I think I, I don't think he's close to assassination at all. I think he's doing exactly what his constituents want him to do. He's or do exactly they want more? Right. Well, I, I'm sure they would. I don't know what more could he possibly do. He's massacring people by, you know, by, 
you know, as, as much as humanly I think possible. And so I think he's doing exactly what people want. The only the only people who oppose him are people that want his seat. Uh, but it's not for political or ideological reasons. I mean, the Israeli society by and large stands behind the genocide. They've always stood behind the genocide. I mean, it's been going on since Israel was established and and and, and the vast majority of Israeli society always stood behind it. There is some kind of, I think, a, a sickness that is that exists in racist genocidal societies, especially some of the societies that are raised and brought up and educated to be racist and genocidal. Israelis are certainly not the first. Uh, hopefully they'll be the last. But that is the reality. And I think Netanyahu, Netanyahu seems to be politically at least uh, very, very safe. And he's doing exactly what his constituents want. So Sounds about right. Um, yeah, so Miko, even right there, uh, is kind of confirming, you know, like, Netanyahu, contrary to what people are saying in mainstream media, is actually doing exactly what his constituents want him to do, if not even more so. And to kind of prove that, um, if you can go to this next clip, so this is from Professor Kallis uh, that I pulled. Uh, so this is from the Israel Democracy Institute. So according to the Israeli, uh, Israel Democracy Institute, 83.4% of Israeli Jews don't think that Israel should take into consideration the suffering of the civilian population in Gaza. Actually, if you can zoom in. Um, so to what extent do you think that Israel should take into consideration the suffering of civilian Palestinian population in Gaza when panics when planning the next phases of fighting there. So mm. I'm going to read the general public. So not a 40% said not at all. 41% said not, not so much. 9% said quite a lot. 15% said very much. 5% said I don't know. Mm. So I wouldn't say an overwhelming majority, but yeah, I mean, well, 40% you know, plus 40% of the like, public. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, and then if you go to the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll end it for this segment. Um, so this was also from Professor Collis. I just pulled the article. I'm not sure where he got this from. It looks like The Guardian, mm -hmm. uh, given the font. Uh, yeah. But you can see this was... Uh, published in 2012. So this poll, well, this article states Israeli poll finds majority would be in favor of apartheid policies. Two thirds say Palestinians should be not allowed should not be allowed to vote if West Bank was annexed, while three in four favor segregated roads. So Harriet Schumann Sherwood in Jerusalem. So if we go down. More than two thirds of Israeli Jews said that 2.5 million Palestinians living in the West Bank should be denied the right to vote if an area was annexed by Israel, in effect endorsing an apartheid state, according to an opinion poll reported by Inharaz. Three out of four are in favor of segregating roads for Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank, and 58% believe Israel already practices apartheid against Palestinians. The poll found. So this was over a decade ago. So long story short, um, you know, it's not BB that is a problem, it's the culture problem. And so, yeah. you know, BB is a very convenient scapegoat for what an overwhelming majority of Israelis think in terms of what's happening in Gaza and how much they really want to off. I mean, you could see online, like the, uh, Abby Martin did a documentary several years ago. You can find it on YouTube where she interviews Israelis and they tell her, you know, we need to kill them, essentially. Yeah. So um, I think now given, you know, how people are seeing a lot of the carnage in Gaza right now, especially a lot of these Zionists who are you know, essentially trying to, uh, or mouthpieces for, you know, the occupation are trying to modify that language a little bit in terms of making it either avoiding not talking about this at all or kind of blaming, you know, everything else, but maybe, you know, their own ugly hearts in terms of what they really think. Um, but it's very evident, you know, given 
you know, what we read and kind of what we're seeing in the polling, um, what is happening in Gaza, at least among Israelis, is actually quite popular. And BB is... The, the only reason that people are having an issue with BB is in terms of his lack of concern for the hostages, really. And so that's what people are protesting. It's not what's happening in Gaza. It's the idea that BB is willing to put the hostages under the bus in order to off Palestinians. So if that wasn't the issue, they, the, the, that you wouldn't see, you know, the protests that are going on in Tel Aviv, essentially. But um, that's all I got. Uh, okay. Any final thoughts before we end? No, I'm just wondering, you know, what's on the horizon for this, you know? Like, what do this you election, mean? well, this election coming up, there's going to be a lot of, like, uh, trying to fix it. I don't know if you remember the Iran hostage negotiation with Reagan. Um, mm -mm. So, uh, there's a conspiracy out there that says essentially that that was planned so that Jimmy Carter, like, who who was originally dealing with it, essentially the minute Reagan was inaugurated, right, the, that deal happened, right? So, you know, literally like the day he was sworn in, you know, that, mm -hmm. that they let go of the hostages or whatever, and we know it's because they gave them weapons. So... You know, which Reagan then had to come out and, and say we did. So, you know, um, so yeah, this next election <coughs> might be something similar to that, I'm betting. Right? Um, sure. But, but it's also, you know, BB's gotten blamed before for stuff, and he's more than willing to crucify himself in that regard. So, yeah. Um, just, you know, interesting subject to look at. So keep your eye out for it. But yeah, anything you want to say before we finish out? No, um, just very depressing. But, <laughs> you know. Yep. Well. <sighs> ugh. So this is why we're demonetized by talking about topics like this. You can go to codashfee.com slash indie news network or scan the QR code on your screen. Um, you know, if you're in the live chat, you can put exclamation mark donate in the chat that way. Always appreciated. Um, you know, if you can't do that, you can go like and subscribe. You could hit the share button, but put it out to your social medias. You can leave a comment even, you know, doing all this engagement helps us beat the suppression. And we appreciate you for helping us out. We're almost at 2K. We're we're getting there. We're like 30 away. So hit that subscribe button. 